Hi, this is the user guide for Pixelator 2. This video will be broken up into three parts, and in the first part I'll show you how to import Pixelator into a Painter project, how to correctly set it up and go over some of the features of Pixelator, and then how to export out a texture using Pixelator. And in the second part, I'll do a retro diffuse style texture and show a few tips and tricks that I use every day. And then in the third part, I'll convert that texture into a set of physically based textures. So to begin with, I'm going to import my model that I've created for this demo, and I'll set it up with some textures that I baked in Marmoset Toolbag. First, I'll do a little bit of setup so I can make sure that I have something to visualize Pixelator on. And I'll do that with a baked lighting stylized filter that I like to use. The baked lighting stylized filter emulates a basic sun and sky using your world space normals that you've baked. You can see right now that because I don't have any, I need to go ahead and add those before I can visualize them. If you haven't baked anything from a high poly model like I have, you can use bake mesh maps and use low poly as high poly mesh to do so. If I go ahead and bake that, you can see that it's going to autofill what I have here. You can also see that it's starting to add some lighting, but because I don't have any real detail to it, it's looking pretty plain. So since I've baked some textures in Marmoset, I'm going to use those instead. Now that I've got those plugged up into my mesh maps, you can see that the sun and sky is giving it a lot more life. One thing to note is that if you've updated these textures outside of Painter, or any other filter or texture or anything for that matter, it won't usually automatically update in your project. So what you would need to do is go into your resource updater, which I've put here. The resource updater will tell you everything that you're using in your layer stack, and anything that's out of date. Those will turn red and you can hit update. You can also reload your textures here really quickly in the library, but again, you'll need to use the resource updater to update them in your actual layer stack. To import Pixelator into a Painter project, it's best to drag it and drop it from the File Explorer into the Painter library, and you'll have a few different options for how you want to import it. The current session option will just import it while you have the file open, and if you close the file, it will be gone from the library. But if you put it in your layer stack, it will remain there. If you've imported it into your project, however, it will remain in your project folder in the library. So whenever you have your project open, it'll be there and you can drag it into the layer stack whenever you like. But I would really recommend bringing it into the library itself so you can use it across any projects you have. I'm going to cancel that though, since I already have it in my library, and I'll just search for it. So you can see it's already applying a basic pixelation effect to the model. And one thing to note about using this filter is that you always want to keep your working document resolution high. And the reason why is because if I zoom in, you can see it's applying filtering to the texture. I have my dimensions in Pixelator defaulting to 256, and if I drop the resolution of my document down to that, you can see it's very, very blurry. So I like to keep this high, and then on export, I export it out at the resolution that I desire. And if not, then I'll downscale it in another program. If you do that, then it will always come out one to one. So you can export a texture out at full resolution, like 2048 here, downscale it to any odd number you want, and it will be perfectly fine. So for the dimensions for Pixelator, you can actually separate the X and Y pixel counts to create stretched pixels if that's what you want. So you can see here I'm getting that kind of effect, and I'll show a couple of different options. Pixelator will also automatically correct for non-square textures when this option is disabled. Then under Pixelate Style, I have a couple of different options for how to actually filter the texture as it's downscaling. Nearest Neighbor does the most basic downscaling of the texture, and then Nearest Softer is going to soften up the edges like you can see here and somewhat down here as well as I switch between the two. You can see some of the details that I've painted here are very, very sharp to be rendered at pixels at this resolution. So Nearest Softer might be something good for this model. Before we talk about the dithering and quantization of Pixelator, I want to mention that it's always best to drag Pixelator, Baked Lighting Stylized, and a few other filters that I'll talk about in the texturing portion of this video from your library into the stack. And the reason why is because they'll automatically set themselves up properly without you having to do any work. So for Pixelator, that means every single channel is set to a pass-through blend mode, which is going to grab the information of whatever's underneath. And same for Baked Lighting Stylized, though there are some filters that work a little bit differently from this. And so you don't really want to configure those manually because it'll be prone to error. Now for dithering, I've offered a couple of different options that you can use, but you can provide your own dither patterns as well. To do that, you would start by creating an 8x8 or 16x16 tiling pattern in any program you want, and import it as a texture into Painter. 
Then you can drag it and drop it into this image input here, and it'll tile across your model, matching the pixel count that you've selected under the dimensions, and allow you to blend between the gradients and the features of your texture in a very custom way. Usually, I like to use either the Bayer or Pattern settings, but I'll begin with showing off noise. This is the most basic kind of pattern you could use to blend between features, but without using any kind of quantization, it's really just adding noise to the image. You can see that I've brought the blend strength up here, so it's very aggressive right now, and I can also have control over the saturation. The other main controls that I have are dithering only the flat areas or dithering only the detailed areas of the texture. If I switch to detailed areas and increase the mask strength, you can see that where I have information here, it's showing up a whole lot more. This is really good for if you have gradients and things like that that you want to have dithering on, but you don't want it to appear on flat surfaces. I'll turn this down though so we can preview the other patterns. Bayer is going to mimic how a camera works, and I think this probably gives the most natural look to your textures when using dithering. But there's also another interesting one that's just a basic RGBW pattern. You can control how it actually gets blended into the texture with either overlay or soft light. I've defaulted it to soft light because I think that tends to look better on bright highlights. Also, I wanted to mention that if you hover over any of the options in Pixelator, it has tooltips that describe what they do and how you might want to use them for your texture. As I said though, dithering is not really going to do too much without quantization, it's just going to blend something on top of the image. What quantization is going to do is limit the amount of colors that appear in your final texture. I have three different modes, and you can see here that if I hover over it, it has rough descriptions of what they do. The palette mode is going to actually emulate the compression that's used in many early 3D games, especially things like on the PlayStation, where the colors that are in the final color palette are generated from the original texture that the author created. There's also per channel, which is just going to limit the number of colors per channel, or the number of bits per channel. So if I decrease this down, you can start to see that it's getting very crunched, and maybe I can bring the blend strength down so you can see a little bit more of that in action. If I switch to colors per channel, you can see I have a lot more granularity over it. And I also have something called the range adaptive mode, and that's not really realistic to what old textures actually look like, but it's a really interesting look nonetheless. What range adaptive mode does is it looks at the brightest part and the darkest part of each channel and limits the crunching of the colors to those ranges. So you actually get a little bit more fidelity out of it. The other mode that I have is using a lookup table, and lookup tables are just pre-computed palettes, basically. I've imported one into this project, but to begin with, I'll show a couple of the ones that I've included. These palettes mimic the look of old computers and consoles, so I'll switch between a couple of these and you can see what they do. If you want, you can also provide your own, and Pixelator offers a bunch of tools for generating your own. Usually, I would recommend doing that in Substance Designer, but you can also do it in Substance Painter itself. Take this one that I've created and import it here, so now you can see that it's taking on the colors of this LUT. Something to understand about LUTs is that just because a color appears in the LUT, it doesn't guarantee that it's going to appear in the final palletized texture. If I bring this blend strength down to zero, you can see that because I haven't painted any red and no red naturally appears in this texture, even though there's a lot of red in this LUT, there's not going to be any in the final texture unless it's a good match for what's in the base texture underneath. So just to show that off, if I paint a little bit of red underneath, and I'll use a softer brush, you can see that it starts to come in as a red once I've painted. And if I increase the dither, you can start to see that where it's falling off into other colors, it offers a lot more blending when I bring the dithering up. I'll also switch to Bayer to show how this looks. And I really think that this is what mimics the old school dithering patterns the best. What Generate Custom Color Palette does is it analyzes the colors in the texture that you've created and it finds the best colors to represent them in a limited palette. So if I decrease the number of colors here from 256, you can start to see that it's using less and less colors, but it still roughly represents what's there. You can see that this is taking on a bit of a red tone because there is some red in the palette now. And if I disable it, you can see that the red is not so dominant anymore, so it doesn't really exist in the palette. I'll turn this back on because I also want to show how the quality and initial random seed sliders work. Basically, this starts off with a random guess of what the best colors are, and it refines that guess over a number of steps. Sometimes it doesn't really land on the best guess initially, though, 
And so this initial random seed parameter allows you to create a new guess with a whole lot of different options. And so you can see that it's starting to find different colors each time. So if I think red's important, then I can hone in on an option until I find one that represents it best. Now, using the quality slider is going to be very, very intensive. So what I would recommend is following the guide in the tooltip and starting off with a low quality, find a random seed that works good for you, and then increase the quality. So if I increase this here, you can see that it's going to take a second to compute, but now it's representing the texture really well. There's also an option for color importance, and that's going to scale how important color is to the final look versus how important luminance is. If I bring this all the way down to zero, you can see that it's not really considering color to be important at all. And if I bring it all the way up, you can see that color is going to be a whole lot more important than the brightness and darkness of the actual texture. Another option that you can use is force black and white, which will insert black and white into the color palette. This is really useful for keeping contrast if you want it, but do note that they take up colors in the palette. So because I have eight colors right now, one of those colors is white and one of those colors is black. You can see that there's a little bit less definition in the colors now, but there's a whole lot more definition in the range. So if you're working with something that's already low contrast, this might not be the best option to use. But if you want to make sure that your textures really, really pop at low colors, this can be super useful. And lastly, if you have a color palette that you like, you can export it out and re-import it as a LUT to use on any other texture that you create in any painter project or anything. I'll set this to true, and so you can see it's generated something like this LUT that I had imported here. If I switch to the 2D view, you can see it peeking through the UV shells. This is basically just a map that determines how the colors in the original texture should look up into this texture and have these new colors remapped onto them. So it's going to find the best match for each color. Using LUTs is very, very fast, but it's not going to be dynamic, like generating a palette per texture. And if I want to export this LUT, then I would go to Export Textures. And here, I've actually created an output template for just exporting Diffuse. Following the tooltip, it mentions that the texture needs to be exported at 4K, and it should not have padding enabled. And this is so it can have those perfect squares to map to. Then, if you were creating a new project and you want to apply this LUT to it, you would just import that into your project, switch to the lookup table mode, and assign it here using custom. If you're going to work with generate custom color palette on, I would really recommend keeping it at a quality of 1, not really playing with the settings too much, and doing most of your painting until you're happy with how the texture is starting to look. Then you can go into quantization and you should start to refine it. So to showcase how that looks, I'll drop back down into here and I'll do some painting and you can see how much slower it is. This is kind of necessary in how it works because it runs on the GPU and it's using an algorithm that's not really designed for it. And so I very much had to hack it in and it took a long time to get it to work. You could also just switch quantization to none and when you're happy with how your texture is coming along and you can see it paints very, very fast, then you can turn that on and start to apply the quantization as you like. Once you're happy with the texture you've created and you're ready to export it, uh, I'll show a couple of the presets that I've created. I've got three main ones that I tend to use. Retro Diffuse from Emissive, Retro Diffuse from Emissive with Alpha, and Retro Diffuse only. I tend to use these two, and the reason why is because if I go into the shaded preview of this texture, you can see that it's getting normal map details, and they're not being pixelated and it's got a whole lot of other lighting information that's happening after Pixelator. Usually, when I'm working, I want to preview my texture flat with no shading, but I'm often creating textures with alpha in them. So what I'll do is I'll paint all of my information into the Diffuse channel, and then at the very end, I black it out and insert it into the Emissive channel instead. So that allows me to preview the material view with an opacity channel that I've painted as well, but without having any problems of shading. So usually I do that by adding a fill layer and making sure that I have all this set up so that it's pure black. But you can still see that no matter what, it still has a bit of shading to it. To correct for that, I can add on an ambient occlusion channel and I'll also add the emissive channel as well. If I enable AO and set it to black, you can see that it's almost there, but I need to go into my shader settings and increase the ambient occlusion intensity to 1. So now I have a pure black unshaded view. And if I want to get the diffuse channel into the emissive, then I can add an anchor point to Pixelator 
and then I'll enable my emissive channel. I'll go to my anchor points and select my pixelator anchor point and then switch it to using the base color. So here it is in the material view with no shading whatsoever. And because I mentioned I usually work with opacity, I'll also enable the opacity channel, but it's unsupported by the default shader, so you'll find it under unsupported if you haven't switched. But if you have switched, you can find it under the normal list. To change your shader, you need to open up your shader settings and select one of the few alpha supporting shaders. The two that I usually use are either alpha test or alpha blend. Alpha test is going to be a binary transparency where it's either completely opaque or completely transparent, and alpha blending is going to be a fade out from opaque. So select that, and you'll see that nothing has really happened yet because I haven't painted any opacity. So I'll make sure that at the base my opacity is fully white, and then I'll add a paint layer where I paint some black opacity into it. For performance reasons, Pixelator only works on the color channel by default. You can enable it on any channel you want, but I would recommend not using quantization on the normal channel because it will produce very strange results that aren't realistic. Now if I enable Opacity, you can start to see it's doing some work here. And again, I have an unshaded view where I can see Opacity on my model, whereas if I switch to the base color and disable this, then I'm not getting any of that because they're all split up into their separate channels. If I re-enable this layer now, I'll rename it to something that I can remember, and then I'm going to export this texture. So finally for exporting it, I'll select my Retro Diffuse from Emissive Output Template, and if you want to create this for yourself, then you can create a new template by hitting the plus button, and underneath your template, you can add an output map like that. For this one, I've selected the base color and set it up as using its RGB, and for the opacity, I've set it up as using its gray. Make sure that you change your output directory off of the default, so I'll just switch to the directory that I'm using for this tutorial, and make sure that you have the output template selected that you want. For the file type, if you're using opacity, then I would recommend that you use a target file because that's going to keep the opacity completely separate from the color information. But if you're using no alpha, then you can use PNG or anything else that's uncompressed. For the output size, because Pixelator has a resolution of 256 for this texture, I can select that one. But you can see that Painter doesn't support anything that's not a power of 2, and it doesn't support anything that's under 128. So if I were exporting this out at an odd resolution, then what I would want to do is export it out at my document resolution, hit export, and then downscale in another program with nearest neighbor. If you're not exporting a LUT, then you can have Substance Painter generate its own padding for the texture. But Pixelator also generates padding itself, so you can switch that to no padding and still get a good result with no seams on the UV edges. Now switching over to Photoshop, I'm going to open the texture that I've exported, and you can see that it has good pixel for pixel padding, as well as pixel for pixel detail inside of the texture. And to downscale it to my final resolution, I want to go to image size and insert the resolution that Pixelator was using. I'll change it to nearest neighbor so that it doesn't do any filtering on the texture, and if I zoom in you can see that pixel for pixel it's still correct. I guarantee that any resolution that you're working with, even if it's an odd number or something completely weird, it will always look pixel for pixel if you downscale it this way. So that pretty much wraps up everything for importing Pixelator, setting it up on a project, and exporting a texture with it. And now we can get on to the fun stuff which is actually texturing this model. Again, for performance reasons, I want to make sure that I'm not using quantization as I work, and I'll disable the dithering so I don't see any noise on my texture as I work. I'll get back to something basic, and we can begin.